I'm Captain Victoria McDonald, and I serve as the Assistant Professor of Military Science for the First Year Cadets in the Yankee Battalion Army ROTC program. And today we'll be having a candid discussion about race. The last few months have been unprecedented. 2020 began with wildfires followed by a global pandemic and an unfortunate series of acts of police brutality that has catapulted the world into a new era of social advocacy. Today, we are going to discuss the impacts of these recent events. We are going to learn and understand the importance of acknowledging race and racism, and how to address this contentious issue as a leader. We are also going to discuss how the Army has been at the forefront of battling injustices and prejudices. So let's begin with the topic at hand. Let's talk about police brutality, and let's talk about the social justice movements that these recent events have spawned. So in understanding police brutality, we have to understand that the American police force was established in Boston in 1838. And from the initial establishment of the first police force, America has a long and exhaustive history of black men and women dying at the hands of cops, whether intentional, unintentional, or due to mistreatment. We're gonna talk about a few individuals who unfortunately passed due to police brutality. We're only gonna talk about a few individuals because the list is exhaustive and it can become very depressing. On March 2nd, in 2006, in Rochester, New York, a woman, a mother, a grandmother, a daughter, a sister, she was killed by the police officer in the Rochester Police Department. They were doing a routine mental health arrest and they ended up killing this young lady. This person was Patricia Thompson. On August 24th, 2019, Elijah McLean, he was killed by a police officer administering the sedatives to this individual. This year, on March 13th, 2020, Breonna Taylor was killed by three plainclothes Louisville, Kentucky police officers who did a no-knock raid in her home as she slept. She was an EMT. On May 25th, 2020, George Floyd, a 46-year-old black man, was killed in Minneapolis, Minnesota during arrest for allegedly using a counterfeit bill. Floyd was killed after a police officer kneeled on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds, where Floyd pleaded with officers stating that he could not bleed and he kept calling out for his mother. And on June 12, 2020, in Atlanta, Georgia, Rashad Brooks was shot in the back from Atlanta Police Department police officers. Again, this list of individuals who died at the hands of cops is nowhere near all-inclusive and nowhere near the number of individuals who have died at the hands of cops. But it is an example that the Black community has to face when we talk about police brutality and police restructuring. In light of the recent events of police brutality, the nation has spawned into an era of social justice and racial equality advocacy. Because of this advocacy, some of the following events did happen. The declaration of Juneteenth as a federal holiday is being considered and many states have adopted it as a national holiday. For those of you who do not know, Juneteenth is a celebration of the actual emancipation of the last remaining slaves under the Confederacy. This occurred on June 19, 1865. This is when the last remaining slaves were considered to be free Americans. This does not consider Jim Crow era laws and things that followed, but that's the day when Black Americans were emancipated. Numerous companies and corporations have began making statements and adjustments to their board of directors to advocate for racial equitability and police reform. The state of Colorado passed the Law Enforcement Integrity and Accountability Act. This bans the use of chokeholds and eliminates the qualified immunity of police officer misconduct. Now let's transition from the civilian sector into the military sector. Let's talk about what the Army is doing to increase inclusivity in its ranks and representation. The Army has changed to adjust their evaluations and their board procedures to remove pictures, names, race, sex, and nationality to reduce the possibility of discrimination. The Army has also chosen to rename some of the bases that are named after Confederate generals. 
Examples of such bases include Fort Hood and Fort Bragg. The Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper, he's implemented a new defense committee on diversity and inclusion in the armed forces. It's to create a defense board comprised of committed civilians and service members dedicated to inclusion and diversity within the military. This is gonna be a permanent board and this is going to seek to ensure that on all levels of the military, there is representation and diversity on each board. Right now, the world is experiencing a major cultural shift and this has been spawned because of social injustices. I'd like to take some time to address racism and aspects of racism and why acknowledgement of these things are very, very important. But before we begin, it is imperative for us to understand that racism in America affects every individual in America, whether you are black, white, or other. Either you are disenfranchised by racism or you benefit from racism. Let's start with understanding what exactly is racism. Racism is the prejudice, the discrimination, and the antagonism directed against a person or a group of people on the basis of their particular racial and ethnic group. It is the belief that groups of humans possess different behavioral traits corresponding with their physical appearance and can be divided on the base of superiority from one race or another. Now that you understand racism, that's not enough. We need to understand the aspects of racism. We're gonna go through a couple of definitions and I'm gonna give you a couple of examples to help understand. We're gonna talk about implicit bias. Implicit bias refers to the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. So an example of that is to tell a black person that they sound intelligent or that they sound white. This insinuates that the speaker believes that black people to sound or are ignorant and their ignorance is reflected in their dialect. So to tell a black person that they sound intelligent implies that you assume that all black people are ignorant. That is an example of implicit bias. In the workplace, a lot of individuals, a lot of minorities experience microaggressions. And it's important that we take time to understand what they are. A microaggression, that's a term, it's used for brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities. It could be intentional or unintentional. For the individual who a microaggression is being placed against, it can be hostile, derogatory, and have negative prejudicial slights and insults groups, especially culturally marginalized groups. An example of this, a blatant example of this, would be a white male saying, I succeeded because I wasn't lazy and I didn't rely on society to help me. This is a slight implying that someone is being lazy and they relied on social services or affirmative action to secure their position in the workplace as opposed to their own merit. So we're gonna talk about how tokenism happens in the workplace and happens everywhere else as well. But I think we should take time to understand what tokenism is. Tokenism is a practice of using the bare minimal effort to appear to be inclusive to members of minority groups. This can be done by recruiting a small number of people from underrepresented groups in order to give the appearance of racial or sexual equality within the workforce. A blatant example of that would be purposely hiring a black woman to serve in an all white male organization and ensuring that she is always standing front and center in corporate photos or just having a woman to come into an organization with all men, or having a black person coming to an organization to take pictures and ensuring that that black person is always on posters around the organization to give the appearance of diversity and inclusion. And also we're gonna talk about something that affects a lot of individuals. Avoiding to acknowledge that racism exists. Avoidance. For someone to say that I don't see color, that's a form of avoidance, and it's dismissive of another person's identity, their reality, and possible discrimination and prejudices that that person say, uh, has experienced. 
So saying that you don't see color and avoiding the issue actually perpetuates and makes the issue worse. We're gonna talk about social privilege. We're not gonna use the word white privilege, but we're gonna talk about social privilege as a whole. Because social privilege is the special unearthed advantage or entitlement used to secure one's own belief to the detriment of, of the others. These groups can be advantaged based on their social class, their age, their disability, their ethnic or racial category, their gender, their gender identity, social orientation, and their religion. It's simply stated, privilege is when you don't think something is a problem because it doesn't affect you. And it doesn't affect you because of a variety of issues. That is privilege. We're gonna talk about social equality. Social equality is a state of affairs in which all people within a special or specific demographic has the same status and possibility of all respects to the majority. These include civil rights, freedom of speech, property rights, and equal access to certain social goods and social services. Social equality is the foundation for social equity. And social equity is ensuring the fair and impartial administration of the laws, fairly and impartially seeking out qualified individuals, whether there are minorities or not, for positions in the workplace and positions of leadership where they're actually represented and encouraging moral and, and a cultural inclusive public leadership that motivates individuals and communities. So social equity is providing everyone with what they need to succeed, not a baseline prepackaged amount of what you think one needs, but what that individual person needs to succeed. A woman may need something different than a man may need something different from a black person or a white person. Equity is individualized. Equality is generalized. Social equity is built on a theory of social equality. Once a person is considered equal, they are now afforded the same opportunities as members of the privileged demographic. After we have digested all of these definitions, I would like to introduce you to the critical race theory by Dr. Gloria Latson Billings. This theory helps to educate and define what the systematic racial construct is in the United States, and it's built on three pillars. The first pillar flat out acknowledges that racism continues to be a significant factor in determining inequality in the United States. The second factor is that the United States society is based on property rights rather than human rights. And the third, pillar is the intersection of both race and property. This creates an analytical tool for understanding how social inequality is administered. So once you understand how access to and owning of property and your race determines your social class, the concept of Blacks being awarded 40 acres and a mule will make a bit more sense to you. Essentially, in the United States, property rights and race can define a person's entire social existence. Now that we have taken time to understand race and aspects of racism, let's transition into our military service and how the Army acknowledges and addresses issues and concerns pertaining to racism and discrimination. The Army is simply a microcosm of society. Everything in society is present in the army. It is to be understood that instances of mistreatment may occur based on discrimination within the army. But as leaders, we have to combat this. And the army has chosen to combat this by educating and training leaders to be fair and equal leaders. And they also has created a robust program to combat discrimination called the Equal Opportunity Program. The army's Equal Opportunity Program exists to maximize the human potential by ensuring the fair treatment of six key categories, a person's race or color, a person's gender, their religion, their age, their disability, and their national origin. This is applicable to everyone in the military community, whether you are a service member, a spouse, or a DOD civilian working on or for the military. 
The Army so serves to cultivate and sustain an environment free of unlawful discrimination and offensive behavior. The EO policy applies to everyone in the Army, on or off installation. It applies to you whether you're on duty or off duty, whether you're working, you're living, or you're having fun at a recreational event. Essentially, a service member must encapsulate the Army's principle on EO at all times. Based on the Army's initiatives to address and eliminate any forms of discrimination within our command, everyone in the Army is empowered to stand up, seek out, and stamp out discrimination and mistreatment immediately. The Army encourages its service members to serve an active role in dismantling the systematic oppression of any person considered to be marginalized. If you ever wondered whether it was okay for you to speak up about racism, the answer is yes. And the Army specifically charges you to do so. And the Army will support you in your efforts. So now let's bring it to the Fordham ROTC program. What can you as cadets or cadre do to bring forth an era of change? Well, the easiest thing for us to do is we can use social media. We can professionally and humanely address racism and prejudice and educate our followers, friends and family on inclusion, equality and equitability. Notice I say professionally, we are a profession of arms. We can address conflict and have debates in a professional manner that ensures that everyone in the debate is respected. So you can respectfully address these concerns on social media. You can protest, you can peacefully protest. However, you cannot wear your uniform or you cannot do it as a representation of the Army or any unit within the Army. If you are protesting, it needs to be peaceful and you must ensure that you're doing it as an individual. Protesting is not rioting, protesting is not looting. Protesting is simply protesting. So you can protest, but you cannot, you should not riot and you cannot and you should not loot. You can petition your local civic leaders. You can write your local civic leaders, your council members, your legislators, your congresspersons, or your senators and demand social act action. And once you petition, you should follow up to ensure that things are progressing. And if you feel that things are not progressing to your liking, that's when you use your voice and vote and you vote these individuals out of office. Do your civic duty to make changes within your community. You can get involved in your schools and your local community. Protesting and advocating on social media, it spreads awareness. But physically getting involved in your local community puts your words into action. Don't just talk about it, be about it. And finally, holistically, I need you to just be an example. As a leader, you will always be watched by the civilian population, your subordinates, your peers, and your superiors. If you walk and you talk and you act like a change agent, change will happen within you and around you. So be the example that you want to see and always ensure that you exemplify the Army's seven values of loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. The last one is very important, having personal courage. Because standing up for what you think is wrong, which may go against some of the individuals around you, may be very intimidating and scary. But it's up to you to have internal or intestinal fortitude and personal courage to stand up for what you believe in, regardless of whether you think it may be unpopular. As you transition from a cadet and you commission into a leader in the United States Army as a second lieutenant, there are things that you can also do to eradicate racism within the Army's workplace. The first thing that we must clearly understand is we have to acknowledge that racism exists. We can't dismiss it, we can't forget it, or we can't hold it off for a conversation for another day. We must acknowledge that racism exists. And once you acknowledge that racism exists, see if you can get someone to help you understand if you have any prejudices or if you have any implicit bias that may impact your judgment or your leadership. Check yourself at the door before you go into the, a leadership position and you're a leader amongst troops because your leadership styles will be endemic of your personal beliefs. 
So if you have implicit biases or stereotypes, you might want to address that before you consider yourself to be a leader. In reading an article called Strengthening Unit Co Cohesion Amongst Racial Tensions, I picked out five key things that a leader can do amongst the troops. Number one is directly engage your soldiers to address these issues head on and listen to their feedback. Do not sugarcoat anything. Talk about the issues at hand, especially if it's pertaining to certain things that's happening right now and uh, the social climate. Address those concerns and listen to the feedback of your soldiers. They may have experiences both in and out of the Army that can be useful for your leadership to change the, cultural, the culture of your unit. Restructure your leadership professional development sessions to discuss racial injustices and inequalities in America and in the military. Don't just use the typical LPD series to talk about the typical things that we do in the Army. Let's get down to the nitty gritty and let's talk about what really affects us in and out of uniform. Let's talk about race. Let's talk about gender harassment. Let's talk about toxic leaders. Let's talk about the issues that are actually affecting us. Restructure your time in front of your soldiers to talk about these issues. So you're gonna also conduct small human resources surveys or sensing sessions and discussions to address the, con the concerns of soldiers, especially those involving discrimination and prejudice. Once you open the door and you create a, a culture that allows free speech, then you can start to address issues specifically using these sensing sessions. Number four, be consistent, be fair, and be positive when enforcing the Army values in the EO policy. Consistency is key. What one person does that may cause them to get in trouble, it needs to happen across the board. We cannot have favoritism. We cannot use nepotism to impact our judgment. We have to be consistent. And number five, after everything is done and you noticed that there may be changes that you need to make within you, don't hesitate to change, evolve, and reevaluate your leadership philosophy. If your experiences have caused you to change in your opinions of certain things, just reevaluate your philosophy, philosophy and move on. These five points were taken from an article from the junior officer website called Strengthening Unit Cohesion Amidst Racial Tension. And finally, I would like to end this lecture talking about the Yankee Battalion, its diversity, and the diversity in the Army. Like the Army, the Yankee Battalion is a microcosm of the Army. We are very diverse. We have a plethora of cadets from all across the nation that have a variety of majors in different disciplines that would like to go off in active duty National Guard and in the reserve to be change agents. We are diverse. We are a diverse organization. And this is a representation of the Army. The Army is diverse. We are living in extremely exciting times. And I hope that these times shape the next generation of Army leaders. I hope that this social advocacy builds an urgency within you to aggressively seek out and eliminate racism and any type of discrimination amongst the ranks, both in and out of uniform. Racism will not be tolerated, and I expect you young leaders to stamp it out at any point in which you encounter it. I leave you with the following quotes and charge you with, the, with incorporating them into your daily operation. Listen to your people and don't wait for them to come to you, as said by Secretary of the Army, Ryan D. McCarthy. Observe and interject when needed. You wanna make sure that you read your audience and you know your cultures well enough to know when there is an issue and don't wait for that issue to be brought to you. Address the issue immediately. And as said by General Creighton Abrams, we need to do less talking the talk and start walking the walk. Because honestly, everyone can be keyboard warriors on social media, but how many of you guys actually get out into the communities? And how many of you guys actually go out and make changes?